It is an honor and a privilege to be with you uh, and to talk about the letter to the Philippians and to discuss how this might be used in preaching. This is one of my favorite texts in Scripture. It is so accessible. It is so uh, understandable. It is so anchored in Christ. Uh, it is so tied to a, uh, a living situation that it, it's just available to us in a very, very special way. It lives, and I'm delighted to be able to share a section of the text with you and to talk about how it can be used in preaching. I think that just about anybody who studies the letter to the Philippians would say that the high point of the letter is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. A section of that text has been called the Christ Hymn since 1927. Maybe an early Christian song that people would have sung when they gathered with the church that lifts up how that Jesus, as high and exalted as he is, gave up everything because he was more interested, more concerned about our needs than he was about his comfort. And if we live like that, how much better life is going to be and how much sweeter fellowship is going to be and how much conflicts ought to go away if we have the mind of Christ and consider the needs of others more important than our own needs. Well, immediately following that text, is the text that we're going to be looking at, where the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, verse, th verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure." Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of Christ, so that the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So he calls on them, he says, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now we are aware from the larger context of Scripture that Paul is not saying, earn your salvation. Paul is saying, when he says, work out your own salvation, he is talking about behaving as a Christian. Work out the implications of your salvation. As people who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, you now ought to live in Christian community like you have been saved by the blood of Jesus. There's a, a fascinating thing going on here. Paul is is sort of bouncing between the things that God does and the things that we're called to do, that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. And that is a tension within Scripture, something that goes back and forth. And some people might say, well, is it us deciding or is it God working in us? And the answer is yes. They're both involved, and that tension or that back and forth is something that's very much a part of the Christian life. A number of years ago, there was a basketball coach by the name of John Wooden. He won an extraordinary 10 NCAA championships, and seven of those were in a row. And when he was uh, at the height of his uh, success, there were some people who wanted to study how he did things. And because of the era in which they were studying, they thought what we're going to find is that Coach Wooden is very, very um, gentle and very affirming and always patting on the back and always saying good job and just really a nice guy. And so they studied him. And what they found was not at all what they expected. What they found was a style that they called scold instruction, that he was tough on his players, 
and he was always correcting them, but he never attacked them as people. He simply corrected the behavior he needed to fix. In scripture today, it's very easy for us to take to scripture the way that we think Paul would be. And maybe we think, like those early researchers, we think that, well, we're going to find in Paul that he's always affirming and always patting on the back. The reality is, sometimes Paul is kind of tough. And at the end of Paul's life, when, he's going, when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he speaks of a faithful preacher as being one who reproves and rebukes and exhorts. So there are things that we do that are encouraging and challenging, but sometimes it is a matter of pointing out what people need to do better. In this text, the Apostle Paul has carried on about how we are to shine as lights in the universe. And as he speaks of these things, I believe that he very much has in mind the division in the Philippian church that he wants them to overcome with the mind of Christ. Following on, there is uh, this section from, cha from uh, chapter th 2, verse 19 through verse 30. He talks about two, two individuals. And some people have looked at this and they have said, this can't even be the same letter. And they have thought, well, Philippians is actually maybe two or three or four different letters all pieced together. There, there's no textual evidence for that at all. And I think properly understood, we don't look at verses 19 through 30 and say, this doesn't even belong here. But I think instead we look at it and we say, this belongs exactly here. That he has talked about, have this mind in you, which also was in Christ early in the chapter. And then he has called on them to shine like stars in the universe. And then he tells the story of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Both of them are unselfish. Both of them have sacrificed for the sake of the Philippians and the kingdom of God. They have sacrificed for others. They've put the needs of others before themselves, just as Jesus did early in chapter 2. And so I think it is a perfect place for this text to be. A number of years ago at the college church, on a Sunday night when we were sending out the campaign groups for the summer, there was a young man by the name of John Anthony Rennick who had grown up in Scotland, and he was telling us why campaigns were so important. He told of how he grew up in the home of a preacher, how he had wonderful parents who raised him in the faith, and yet he said faith didn't become real to him until the summer that the Harding University campaigners came over and worked with his home congregation. He said, because the campaigners were much closer in age to him, he could relate to them in terms of faith. And faith was real. His parents, he said, were wonderful people, but they were like a different species. They were parents. These campaigners were close to him in age. They enjoyed a lot of the same things, some of the, of the same, uh, same movies and same music. And because of that, when he saw faith in them, the bridge wasn't quite so long for him to walk over to find that faith was real in his life. I think in the same way, maybe Paul starts at the beginning of chapter 2 with the ultimate example the unselfishness of Jesus. But at the end of the chapter, he comes up with these two stories of people who are, are closer to being like the Philippians. And he points to them as models of people who are unselfish and who care about others. There is such richness in these texts in teaching about the imitation of Christ in our lives.